Welcome to Permission to Shift, the show that helps you release limits, transform fear, and get into a life you're excited to live. Today's guest is David Mead. David is passionate about leadership and about bringing out the human leadership in the teams he coaches, encouraging his clients to embrace behaviors that build trust, relay genuine care, and allow others to feel valued and valuable as they work towards building something bigger than themselves. Having worked with over 250 organizations around the globe, including Capital One, Verizon, Marriott, and Deloitte, David uses speaking, workshops, training, podcasting, and a wide variety of other platforms to share ideas that help people work better and be better. David was a founding igniter on Simon Sinek's team and the co-author of the book Find Your Why with Simon Sinek and Peter Docker, which has been translated into over 25 languages and has sold more than 450,000 copies worldwide. I am thrilled to invite David to the Permission to Shift show today. It is really awesome to have you here with me today, David. Thank you for coming in. Thank you, Anna. Awesome. So can you give our audience, for those who don't know you, a little bit of history, what you've done and how you've gotten to where you are and what you're doing? Yeah, sure. So um, it all started in the spring of 1977. Uh, <laughs> maybe I want to back up. <laughs> so, okay, well, let's, let's start with, we'll back up to like career. Let's start with career beginning. How about that? You know what? That's great. Um, so graduated college and then like found myself in this, I found myself in a series of sales jobs that I hated. I hate, like, I just, I wasn't good at it. Um, and so I ended up um, finding a job in sales training. So I didn't actually have to sell. I was just, you know, training the people that were selling. Um, and I really enjoyed it. I loved like um, sharing information that helped sort of a light go on for people and the, you know, to teach them a concept or an idea or a different way of looking at something and having them go, Oh yeah. Like I've never thought about it that way before. Um, and so I thought, man, like I, and, and my dad was a, um, I, he, he was a, a, an international consultant in communication. And so he did the same kind of thing. He traveled around a lot and stood in front of rooms of people and, and taught, taught stuff. And I thought, I'd kind of like to try that. And so when I got into this sales training thing, I kind of got a taste of that and I loved it. The thing I didn't like about it is because it was sales, turnover in sales is usually so high. Mm. So I would spend like, you know, a couple of weeks with these people training them through this training process that we had. And then, you know, six months later they were gone and it was like, ugh, like it just, it felt there was like that missing piece of like, I don't get to see them actually do anything with the information that I gave them long-term, you know? Mm. Um, and so um, I took a departure from that for a couple of years, tried uh, my own thing, had my own business uh, for a little while, um, selling uh, kitchen and bath supplies right around 2008. So you can, you know, uh, sort of guess how that turned out with the housing market, the way it went. Um, and That's through, unfortunate timing. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, hindsight is great. Um, anyway, but through that, I found myself working uh, part-time at, at an Apple store. Um, and through from there, I it was the funniest thing. I was in, I was done with my shift, and I loved working at Apple. And I, I really wanted to. Am I? Is this too long? Like, am I? No, you keep okay. going. This is perfect. So, um, I was at the end of my shift, and I loved working there. And I actually wanted to sort of follow the corporate track at Apple and like be there forever. But nobody ever quit, and so I couldn't like <laughs> find myself moving up. So I was at the end <laughs> of the shift, and I was you know in the back like getting all my stuff, getting ready to go home, and sort of under my breath talking to myself, we all do it, but I was talking to myself and I was like, man, I gotta, I gotta find another job. Mm. And a buddy of mine overheard me and he said, Hey, I, uh, a friend of mine just started this, you know, new startup. It's a door to door sales company. You know, it's probably great potential there for you to like, at least get started. And, you know, cause I had a young family at this point. I was, um, I was in MBA school at this point as well. And I like had all these pressures and all this stuff that I was like, I just, I'm not making enough money at Apple. Right. So, I went and, you know, I was like, great, I'll give it a shot. I hate sales, but here I am going back <laughs> to sales again. And so I talked to this um, friend of a friend who was, you know, was starting up this, this company. And he said, you know what? Um, we actually need a director of training. And with your experience, we'd love to have you do that if you want to do that. I was like, yes, sold. <laughs> if I don't have to go out knocking doors in the summertime, perfect. So I'd been there about a week um, and... 
we were, and then they, they, they had this sort of evening event, right? And they brought in this speaker, some guy named Simon Sinek. Um, and it was a school night. And I'm that kind of nerd that never missed a day of school. But I was <laughs> into the company and I was like, I want to make a good impression. I want to show them that I'm like committed and whatever. So I guess I'll go, you know? And so Simon came and he spoke to um, this group of, you know, 25 people at some startup in Salt Lake City, you know? It's amazing. And, yeah, before, you know, like anybody had any clue who he was. Um, and the, the light bulb just sort of went off in my head. And I was like, oh, like, duh, the concept that he shared was so simple. It was so easy. Um, and so I actually, I, I stole his idea and I incorporated it into the training material that I was writing for this company as the, as the director of training. Um, and he came back to visit us two or three times. He did some work with us. And I, I gave him a copy of the manual that I had put together, this training manual. It sucks. I still have a copy of it. <laughs> not good. But I gave it to him just to show him like what he inspired. You know what I mean? Um, and I didn't expect him to read it, and I don't think he did. But his um, this, the the other person who wasn't working with him at the time, Kim, probably I mean did read it, and she probably showed it to him, and they probably looked at it together. But I got a call about three months later, um, and Kim was like. Uh, you only heard Simon speak once, right? This was before the TED talk or his first book or anything, right? So he was not like on YouTube yet. And I was like, yeah. And they were really surprised that I was able to hear him speak one time and actually turn it into something. Um, and so they asked me to, if I wanted to come and help create this online course that they were putting together. And I was like, sure. So I would wake up at like five o'clock in the morning and work with them for a couple of hours and then go to my full-time job and try to incorporate all this cool stuff that I was learning um, at this, you know, startup where I was working. And so I did that for a couple of years. Um, and if, I mean, this, this company where I had this full-time job, they just like, they didn't get it. And they were not terribly interested in what I was trying to do with the culture and with these ideas that I was learning. Um, and so they let me go in June of 2011. And so I was, you know, standing out there on the, you know, in the parking lot with my box of stuff, waiting for my wife to come pick me up. Um, and we drove to the park afterwards, um, close by, and I called uh, Simon. And I was like, hey, I, I got some more time. <laughs> Anything else for me to do? So um, he brought me on, uh, and I started, you know, working with, with him and, and Kim full time. Um, and I started out, uh, you know, responding to emails because by this time the book and the TED talk were out. Um, it was later in, you know, that came out in later in 2009. Um, and I was writing website content and, you know, just kind of all kinds of different stuff, but I was behind the screen all day. And um, we were getting probably 15, 20 requests a week for Simon to come speak, um, which back then was a lot. Um, yeah. And so I called him and I said, Hey, like, you've got, you know, all these requests, you can't do them all, you know, a bunch of people, you know, want you to come out, but some of them can't afford you. Other ones you just don't have time for others. You're just not interested in like, it's, it's a bummer that all these people are not hearing this message. So what if like, I, I know the stuff like the back of my hand, I, I mean, as much as I love being behind a computer, I would so much rather be in front of people like sharing these ideas. What if I went and did some of these that you don't want to do? And there was like silence on the, on the other end of the line. <laughs> And then he goes, David, I'm disappointed. I was like, wow, oh, crap, I totally blew it. And he goes, I'm disappointed you didn't think of that sooner. <gasps> <laughs> and I was like, all right. Yeah. So he's like, go out and get some practice. And so I went out for a year and I spoke to every Rotary Club and every you know, Chamber of Commerce, anybody who would come let me talk for 15 minutes while they were you know, eating lunch together um, and just practiced, you know, sharing these ideas. Um, and then in, I think, I don't know, I can't remember late 2011 or two, no, it would have been 2012, I guess I got my first paid like speaking gig. Um, and so for the next eight years, that's what I did. Um, and I traveled all over the world, um, sharing, you know, Simon's ideas and content and as new books came out and new stuff, I would develop workshops and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So um, did that until December of 2019. Uh, and then I stepped away from Simon's team in 2019. And since then, I uh, have been working on some of my own stuff. Same, you know, same idea of leadership and culture, because I'm so, I'm so fascinated by all the stuff that we 
that we know is right and yet we still don't do it. And so trying to figure out how do we sort of crack that code? How do we get people to, to do the things that they know they need to do in order to be a good leader or to build a strong culture or to build trusting relationships? We all know how to do it. But because of all the pressure and all the crap and all the stuff that's going on around us at work all the time, we don't do it. Um, and so it's, I've sort of made it my mission to help people figure out, like, how do we do that so that we can actually have trust, so we can actually build stronger relationships and thrive and progress together and do something that matters. So I know you have a term for what you're talking about. So yeah. can you share that term with us and sort of... I, you just shared the vision, but a little bit more about that vision. And then I have another question for you. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, um, in that meantime, before I get to that, of that, you know, 10 years that I spent with Simon, uh, I helped him write that book that's behind you right there, Find Your Why. That came out in 2017. So that's that's been really cool. Um, uh, and that was a cool experience. Hashtag so, product, okay. product placement. Yeah. <laughs> Very strategic. <laughs> I like the way you do that. Um, totally unintentional, I'm sure. Oh, for sure. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, I mean, I have a term that I use, and this is also the, the, the working title of um, the book that I'm writing. It should be coming out in January or so. Um, but it's like the idea of the, the title of the book is Behind the Curtain. Um, and the, the meaning behind that is there is so much... And this is, I'm focusing on the, the world of work because that's where most of us spend our time, most of our time, but it, it's not, um, it's not limited to that. This, this happens everywhere. Um, and I think it's a, it's a timeless concept and, and depending on the culture in which we live, um, it, it's more pronounced or not. Um, but this idea that there's so much pretense, there's so much fakeness, there's so much facade, there's so much like putting on an act. Yeah. Um, and again, I'm focusing on when we're at work of, and, it, and it's sort of, it, it's two different poles. So if you think about it from somebody who is a, a leader in a leadership position, right? So often that facade comes out or that, you know, being behind the curtain and putting up that, putting on the act comes out in the form of um, pretending to be more powerful than you are, more connected than you are, more intelligent, more experienced, more whatever. And so you put on this act and, and your ego takes over and you, you know, you put on this persona that you know everything, you can do everything, you have all the answers, and all, which is just absolutely not true. <laughs> on the other end of the spectrum, there are the people who are kind of at the bottom of the totem pole who are hiding behind the curtain for a very different reason. They are afraid for their jobs. They're afraid to speak up. Um, they don't want to rock the boat. They just want to put on a smiley face and, and be happy and pretend everything's fine at work, even though it's not. But either way, there's so much fakeness and pretense going on at work that when that is happening, we cannot connect as human beings. We can't build trust. We can't collaborate together because we don't actually know what's real and what's not. So how do we know who to trust and who we can't? If we can't be real with each other, if we can't open up and be transparent, stay in front of the curtain and admit our fallibility, talk about mistakes, openly, you know, communicate about the things that are not going well and, and or the, the tension that we have in a relationship. Look, I'm not perfect at it either. I do it too, right? Like all, uh, and I, I, I mean, I think about, um, you know, not so much in the last year and a half that I've been sort of on my own, but in other times in my career, I have uh, pretended that everything was fine. I put on a happy face at work when I was screaming inside. Mm -hmm. um, I have... Uh, you know, tried to say all the right things to the right people to protect my job and to make sure that, you know, I'm still going to be able to follow my, my little track up, up the ladder. We do, we all do it and we do it for different reasons. But the, the idea is that when we do that, we're hindering the opportunity to really connect. So what do you think of the fake it till you make it? Uh, I hate it. <laughs> um, I actually address that in my book a little bit. And this, this approach that I have is, and I know a lot of people are going to hate that, but it's completely anti fake until you make it because faking it sucks. And because faking, it means that we have to keep everything to ourselves. We have to pretend to be somebody that we're not. And so how can you let people in when you're pretending to be somebody you're not? So talk to me about that because there's, there's a difference between being somebody you're not and stepping into who you can be. 
And it is a di there is a difference there. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, um, it's a great question. It's not something I necessarily thought of in that way. So I'll try to make it as coherent as I can as I, as I <laughs> sort of just think out loud. I, I think there's there's nothing wrong with aspiration and wanting to be a better version of ourselves or wanting to be you know somebody who we are not yet. But I think the real the the real kicker is what's the intent and who's it who's it meant to serve, right? Are we doing it for our own benefit or are we doing are we try, do we want to get better? Do we want to become somebody who we're not? Do we do we step into that that role and, and try to you know be more confident than we really feel in that moment because we want to because we want to be a, a strength or a rock for other people, right? Who are looking mm -hmm. to us for guidance or leadership. So. I think that's really, for me, that's the litmus test is why are we doing it? Are we doing it to advance ourselves? Or are we doing it to advance other people? I love that service versus self. Yeah. That is powerful. So talk to me about human leadership and how it plays a role in this whole equation. Yeah. So the, when, when we are, behind the curtain, when we're putting up this facade, when we're essentially lying, faking and hiding. And again, that's not a, a bad thing necessarily. Again, we might be behind that curtain to protect ourselves in a toxic environment. So I don't want to, I don't want to make it, I don't want to make the, the people who are hiding behind the curtain, it's hiding behind the curtain is not good or bad. It just is. And the, there are a lot of good people that hide behind the curtain for different reasons, right? Um, the, but the, the idea is when we are hiding something, there's a chance that it's going to come out and it usually does, right? We have, we see so many, you know, examples in, you know, the news or politics or Hollywood or whatever of these people who we thought were just these shining examples of, you know, ethics and morals. And all of a sudden they get caught doing something that have been, you know, they've been doing for the last five years sort of behind <gasps> the curtain. And we're like, Oh my gosh, I can't believe it. You They're know? human. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but whenever we're lying, faking and hiding, the chances are we're going to be exposed. Right. And so when that happens, when, when these things happen, you know, when we see these. Um, so you think about, for example, college admission scandal, uh, Bernie Madoff, Ellen DeGeneres, what, whatever it is, we, these stories break and we're like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe it. That was so unexpected. Right. And you bring this into a work context where you're in a meeting and you get thrown under the bus. Um, you make a values based decision and you get in trouble for it. And all of these these things, these types of things happen at work. And we're like, wait, what? Like what just happened? These things are unexpected and those unexpected experiences are what we're trying to eliminate because when we're behind the curtain, we're more likely to give an unexpected experience to someone or when somebody's behind the curtain, we're more likely to experience them in an unexpected way when that thing that they're hiding gets revealed. And we're like, wait, what just happened? And that unexpected experience is what breaks down trust. So my, um, I have a, a a guy who's becoming a friend, his name's Jeb Hurley. He's a behavioral scientist. And his, he's done a lot of research on brain science and how the way our brains interpret things, when we experience the unexpected, trust is impossible. But when we have experiences that match our expectation, that's when trust can be built. And so the only way that we can really um, experience what is expected is to be real to not be hiding anything. So we don't have the opportunity or the chance for that thing that we're hiding to be exposed and to be to, to have people say, oh, that was unexpected. I didn't expect that to happen. So the question is, how do we then open, pull back the curtain and stay in front of it? So we're not hiding something so that we can make that connection. So we aren't creating that unexpected experience for people. Does that make sense so far? It does make sense so far. But my question then is, okay, so- And I was maybe... getting to your original question of what is human leadership, by the way, I didn't forget. Perfect. But I'm say I'm in front of the curtain and, and as a YouTuber, the marketing's involved. Okay. So let's say I'm, I'm doing and I'm creating and whatever, and then something, you know, I make a mistake or something goes wrong. Is that hiding or is that accidental? And how do you tell the difference to your audience or how, how do they tell the difference? It depends on what you do in that moment. So the, the time that we hide behind the curtain is when we make a mistake and then we pretend that nothing happened, right? When we, when clearly somebody can see like something unexpected happened, right? Usually your, your, you know, if your, your videos or your, your presentations, whatever, are really polished and all of a sudden you, you make a mistake and something just isn't right and people are like, whoa, didn't expect that from her. Your version of hiding behind the curtain might be, I don't know what you're talking about. It's, it's totally fine. Completely <laughs> denying that something went wrong or justifying it or going, oh, it was my production crew. They totally screwed it up. 
Mm. That's hiding behind the curtain. Whereas staying in front of it would be, you guys, you know what? I'm usually really consistent in how this happens. And for this one instance, I don't know, I, I'm, I, it, it was my bad. I screwed up and I gave you something that wasn't my, my normal quality. Sorry, I'll try to do better, right? That's eliminating the curtain because you're opening up the lines of communication. You're talking about it. When that unexpected experience happens, you're not pretending that it didn't. You're not shifting blame onto somebody else. You're taking ownership for what's yours, admitting your own fallibility, mm -hmm. which is part of human leadership we'll talk about in a second. But that gets rid of the curtain because you're not back there trying to pretend that nothing happened. You're not up there back there putting up an act or a facade that, no, that's totally normal. Or, yeah, I'm, I'm, still, I'm still exactly who you think I am. I'm still good. It was somebody else's fault, right? Right. But that gets really difficult in corporate because you're trying to reinstitute agency in an environment where agency has been yanked out because whoever is responsible gets blamed and gets trashed. Yeah. And this really, I mean, like, like most um, leadership ideas or leadership principles, this works best when it starts at the top. It doesn't always, right? Because often the people at the top don't practice human leadership, which I'll talk about here in just a second. They're not willing to open the curtain, to be humble, to be honest about what happened and to, to admit that they're human like everybody else, right? Um, and so that's really the challenge is, and, and, it's, and again, it's not that you have an excuse. If, you're, if your leader is, is like that, you can't just fold your arms and say, well, I mean, there's nothing I can do about it because that's how they are right? We all have the opportunity and the responsibility to show up as human leaders for the people around us. We all influence people in a certain way, right? So we can protect and we can help and we can create an environment for the people directly around us, even if we're not getting that from our leader. And if it gets to the point where it just, it, it's not working and we can't function because of the way that our leader is, then we have a choice to make. There are a lot of places to work. And there are a lot of companies who are recognizing and realizing the importance of how they treat their people and of creating these cultures where people feel safe, where they feel like they belong. And again, it's, it's a hard decision to make. So many mm -hmm. people stay in a job just because there's job security. They've been there forever. They don't know where else they would go. It's hard to, to, to switch jobs. There's a ton of uncertainty that comes along with that. So I'm not saying that, you know, just up and quit if it's not working. But at some point, when you become conscious and aware of these things and you realize this is not working for me and this is, this is not helping me to become who I want to be, you have you always have the choice. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about, oh, sorry, carry no, on. I, don't I, wanna... say it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's, again, it's not a right or a wrong choice. It's just a choice that needs to be made. Mm. It is a choice that needs to be made. And that's a hard choice to make. But it let's... Is. Let's talk about then when you're talking about making these choices and deciding on the culture and if the culture is a good fit, human leadership is basically the footstool for modifying culture in an organization. Yeah. So um, interesting that we'd use that term of a footstool, because if you think of human leadership, you can actually think of it as a three-legged stool, right? There are three components to it. Yes. Nailed it. <laughs> um, so human leadership is essentially a, a combination of three traits um and the, the way that i've um, come up with these and again all of the none of the uh, none of the stuff i'm talking about is new i mean people listening to this are like well, yeah i know that already so i don't have any brand new ideas but the way that i approach it is i look at my own experience how i have experienced leaders throughout my life whether it be in the boy scouts or at work or wherever like it's not I'm not talking about strictly corporate i'm talking about leaders sports all these all this kind of stuff plays in coaches right mm -hmm. um and i think about all and plus pairing that with the decade or so that i've been out having the great opportunity to observe and to work with leaders all over the planet and how their cultures work and what i found is that culture always mirrors leadership always so as I think back to the, the best leaders that I've had, the ones that I remember for all the right reasons, I made a list of all of their qualities, all of their traits, dozens and dozens of things of how they behaved and, and how they showed up. And obviously it's a lot harder to talk about 48 things than it is to talk about three. So I take a look at those, you know, that list of dozens and dozens of qualities and I've broken them down and really every single one of them to me fits under three traits which are honest, humble, and human. 
and I go beyond the, the dictionary definition of those, but these really are the three-legged stool, right? And the reason that I compare it to a three-legged stool is because you can't have one without the other two, or you can't have two and be missing one. The stool doesn't stand out, right? You cannot be humble and human, but not be honest about what's going on or, or when you make a mistake, right? Humble and honest are, are really sort of tied together in a way. You can't be you know, honest about um, you know, the mistakes that you make and humble enough to admit them, but not be human enough to recognize and be okay with somebody else making a mistake. It doesn't work. You have to have honest, humble, and human. It's a three-legged stool and all three legs have to be on the stool in order for it to work. Um, so that's, I mean, that's the basis of it. We can get into, I don't know if you want to get into some of the details of each one of those legs, but the idea is that the, what do you do with a stool? You sit on it, right? That's the whole point of it. So the idea is not just to have the th have three legs and have a stool that will stand by itself, but to have a stool that's strong enough that will withstand the pressure of sitting on it. So it's easy to talk about, you know, we're, we're an honest company. We live our values, right? We do what we say. Um, it's easy to talk about being a humble company where, you know, everybody's ideas are valued and we, we want to hear from everybody and, you know, nobody's too proud to like, it's not my idea, it's our idea, right? <laughs> Or we always put our people first, right? This human element. Yeah. It's easy to talk about that stuff. And it looks like the stool is great. Three legs are on and it's standing there all by itself. But when you turn it over and you realize that that stool is only being held together with masking tape and gum. And when you put any kind of pressure on it, when you add, you know, budgets, client demands, you know, uh, deadlines, it, all that pressure that comes with the day-to-day -day work that we do, if the legs really aren't securely attached, if you're not really practicing those things, the stool crumbles and falls over. And as soon as we sit on it, we find ourselves on the floor and we think, whoa, again, unexpected experience. What just happened? I thought that you said this, this, and this. Well, that's not really what we do around here. Mm -hmm. And then the safety collapses and the culture collapses around the lack of safety. And then we're at each other's throats and just vying to see who's wrong. Right. And we're watching out for ourselves. Again, we're going back to the selfish versus selfless, right? We're, talking, mm -hmm. we're thinking about ourselves. We're, we're watching over our shoulders. We're protecting our own interests rather than being able to let go of all that because we feel safe and being able to contribute what we have and what we bring to work to lift others up and to work and collaborate together. It's like that stool is a way to help elevate, elevate people through Maslow's hierarchy in a context of the corporation yeah. instead yeah. of pushing them back down to like the basic. Yeah. That's powerful. Yeah. yeah. So walk us through these three legs. I think that would be very, very useful and service to the audience here. Yeah, for sure. So um, there, there's not one, uh, one way to define honest, humble, and human. Uh, and again, I'm approaching it from my experience and, and what I have observed. So I would always invite anybody who uh, is introduced to these concepts to think about for themselves, how does this show up for me? How would I define it? What does that look like when I do it? Um, because my definition might not fit exactly with what your definition might be. Um, but for honest, right, we'll start there. For me, the I mean, obviously telling the truth and, you know, following through on our commitments and all that kind of stuff is really important. But when it comes to um, honest for me, the, the crux of it is really around behaving in alignment with what we profess to stand for. So as a leader in a company, for example, if we are, you know, always telling, if we're always spouting off the company values and, you know, this is how we behave and this is not acceptable and this is acceptable to actually follow through and do that yourself. I know it sounds silly because, well, duh, why wouldn't a leader do that? But they don't, right? You can, I mean, we've all heard, you know, the CEO, the, 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 the director stand up on a stage at the, at the yearly offsite and talk about, you know, our values and they're so important and all this stuff. And then the rest of the year, they're beating people over the head for performance-based results. And forget about the values, just get the number, right? Mm -hmm. This inconsistency in what we say and what we do is a huge um, factor in if trust is built or not. So again, I found, and, and to get into a little bit more detail, if you want, um, <clears throat> I found three things that really can break that honest leg of the stool. 
Uh, and there are, there are many more, obviously, but again, the things that I've noticed that really can damage that leg and again, make it so the stool falls over are inconsistency in words and actions, which we just talked about. When what we say, what we profess, what we believe is not actually what we do. So in the work context, for example, this might look like, um, you know, telling our team, we, we have an open door policy, come talk to me anytime. But then as soon as, as, soon as somebody comes in, we brush them off because we're too busy and we don't have time to talk. It's like, wait, what? Again, unexpected, creating those unexpected experiences that break down trust, right? So inconsistency in words and actions. The second one is inconsistency and accountability. And this is when we um, deflect the accountability that comes along with our position onto someone or something else. So, you know, for example, you have, <coughs> excuse me, somebody on your team who is struggling they have a tense relationship with one of their teammates right and they come to you asking for for help in you know sorting through this this issue and it's absolutely something that falls under your uh your accountability but because you don't want to strain a relationship with one person or the other because you're friends with both of them you send them to hr instead mm. it's like really like you, you could really help me out with this and you're sending me to some stranger who doesn't know the context of the situation you know um, and then third thing is an inconsistency in focus. This is when our priorities, our vision, or our direction shift sporadically, just depending on what's going on that day. Um, I can't tell you how many times uh, in my career I've started on a project <clears throat> that this is what we're doing, 100%, like, go, 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 go. And then two weeks later, it's like, eh, we're not doing that anymore. <sighs> it's like there's nothing more demoralizing than putting all of your time and energy and effort into something and then all of a sudden having to switch direction. And it's not that, you know, I mean, it, it, it's going to happen, you know, every once in a while, but when that becomes the norm, that's the problem. Because then when somebody, you know, when the leader says, well, this is our top priority, we, we just don't believe them. There's no trust there, right? Yeah. Because that honest leg of the stool is broken because what they say, again, this kind of goes back to the words and actions thing. What they say is not what they follow through on. Yeah. The priority of the day. Flavor of the month, whatever you want to call it. Oh, flavor of the month. Yeah, I've heard that one too. Yeah. Um, <laughs> embarrassingly, like I've actually been on the front end of that because, in you know, through the speaking and workshops that I've done, people get excited and they, you know, learn these, some of these new ideas and new ways of thinking. And they think, oh my gosh, I'm going to go back and I'm going to implement this. And, you know, I'm going to do this and this and this differently. And they get back and their team is like, oh, you just went to a conference. You know, we're going to be doing this for the next two months. And then, you know, it, it, it's hard. It takes, you know, it, it takes a lot of consistency and effort to keep this stuff going. A lot of times leaders don't, they just fall back to what they were doing before. And then they read another book and they're like, Oh, we're doing this now. And the, and the, and the team just like, here we go again. You know, sounds like parenting. <laughs> um, oddly, a lot of really great parallels yep. in this parenting for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the, the basics of honest, right? Um, and then we move on to humble. And again, a lot of these, these are not, these three things are not mutually exclusive. They really do support each other and there's alignment um, between the two, but humble is really, uh, it, it's, it's kind of what you think. It's uh, dropping your ego, first of all, admitting your fallibility and being willing to admit and learn from your mistakes, right? Um, and there's, I mean, ego, I think is one of the, the biggest blockers to great leadership. And again, ego in Latin means I, right? Mm -hmm. It's a focus on self. It's a focus on your own interests rather than somebody else's. Now, it's, I mean, there's nothing wrong with taking care of ourselves. There's nothing wrong with watching out for ourselves. But um, where it gets detrimental is when doing it negatively affects somebody else, right? So we have to find that balance. Um, and there's nothing wrong with, uh, with confidence either, but ego and confidence are not the same thing. Um, Peter Docker and I, the other co-author of, of Find Your Why, um, we both talk about this concept of humble confidence, where often humility gets a bad rap because <clears throat> we think when a leader is humble, they're weak or they're submissive or they're you know shy or timid, <clears throat> and that's not the case. Um, humility is also in recognizing our strengths and what we're great at. But using those and recognizing that those are things <clears throat> that can lift and <clears throat> um, 
So humble confidence is really about how do we recognize what we're good at and acknowledge that and be okay with it, not because it makes us better, but because when we are good at those things, we can use those things to, again, share and uplift and elevate the people around us. Um, and so when we can replace that ego with humble confidence, um, we're in a much better place. So again, thinking back to all of the great leaders that I've had, um, those that, when I think of the, the humble element, there are really four attributes that, that come out for me. Um, first thing is the, the willingness to do what we ask others to do. It's not that we always will, that we always have to, or that we always have to step in, but when it really counts, when it really matters, um, we are willing to let go of our title and you know, to put up with the, the inconvenience or the struggle or whatever it takes to get in the trenches with the team and help out. Um, it's like you, know, the, you hear the stories of the, the, the team who's just busting their butts working after hours to get this project done. And the boss walks out at five, be like, hey, guys, good luck. You know, mm. it's not that he has to stay late every single night. But you know what? When they're really struggling, when you can tell that they need a little bit of a boost, drop your bag, get in the trenches for an hour and help give them some direction. You know, uh, another really um, sort of completely other end of the spectrum experience. When I was 17, uh, I worked at this bagel shop and it's a job that I uh, I still have one of the menu boards, actually. It's, hand, ha it's hanging in my studio downstairs because it reminds me of this job. I have compared every other job that I've had to this one. Um, and it's because we had this incredible uh, boss, the guy that ran the shop, Colin Brad. He was such a perfect example of this. So um, we were, uh, the shop was right on, on Main Street. And during lunch, we would always get super, super busy. So there was a line that would go from, you know, the counter out the door and up the sidewalk. And so the lunch rush was just nuts. And he would never hesitate, like if we were really slammed or if we were a person short, for example, just to throw on an apron and make sandwiches with us, you know? It's just what he did. And um, and again, it's not that the idea is for the leader to always be in the weeds and always be, you know, doing stuff or micromanaging. It's that when it really matters, they're willing to do the things they ask others to do. Um, so that's the first thing. And then the second thing is the... Um, the, the, the confidence to let other people lead, which is so hard to sometimes give up that control, right? Because people are going to do it differently than we would do it. Um, it's like going back to parenting, right? It is tough to let your kids mow the lawn or fold the laundry because you're just going to do it better than they are because you have so much more experience. But when you're a humble leader, you recognize that you're in a position to help others develop and learn and grow. And even though they're going to do it a little bit differently than you might do it, they're not going to do it maybe as well as you would do it. Allowing them to do it and to try and to fail and to try again builds their confidence. And as a result, builds our confidence in them. Right. And so it's sort of a win-win with some short-term tough stuff. Um, third thing is the, um, the, 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 the ability to ask for and accept help. And for so many people, leaders or not, that is really, really difficult. It's so um, funny to me. Like, I, I don't, I, I can't say it's a habit, but I do it fairly frequently. When I see people pulled off to the side of the road, um, you know, changing a flat or whatever, um, I will pull over and I used to stop and say, hey, do you need any help? Blew me away how many people said, no, no, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. And I stopped asking because nobody accepts help. I don't say nobody. Few people accept help because they, nope, I can do it. I got this. I've changed a tire before. You know, I, I'm capable. And so I just, I just walk up and I start helping. Hey, what can I do to help? Because mm. we have a hard time accepting help. And so I think that's one of the things that really helps with our humility is to recognize, you know what? I can't do it all. I don't have the time. I don't have the knowledge. I don't have the experience. I don't have the whatever. That takes humility to recognize that we don't have something and to recognize somebody else does and be willing to allow them to, to help us. Um, but the thing is, it, how good does it feel when we offer help and somebody says, yeah, I'd love your help. It feels so good. It's like a blessing to be able to, to, to do that for them. Um, and so even remembering that of when we're having a hard time saying yes to help, remember, it's a gift for the person who's offering, right? Um, and so uh, that's, what is that, the third thing? I think it's the third thing. Yes. Um, the last thing is uh, the, the willingness to admit mistakes. It's not the willingness to make mistakes because we're all going to make mistakes. It's the <laughs> willingness to admit them. 
right? Um, and there's uh, there is some fascinating case studies around this, but um, for the sake of time, I'll, I'll just give you a short example. So I was um, talking to a, a group of folks in the agricultural industry in your hometown, Winnipeg, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And uh, one of the guys that uh, was in the audience was a leader at one of the, the financial institutions that um, provides loans and other financial services for the agricultural community. And he said something that really stuck with me. He said that when he hires somebody new, he tells them to make as many mistakes as they can and to make them as often as possible. Because he re recognized that it, the point is not to be perfect at your job. The point is to always be getting better at your job. And the only way you get better is if you learn. And the only way to learn is to make mistakes. And so um, he was so intent on creating an environment where his people felt like it was okay to admit a mistake and to say, hey, I screwed up. This is something that I learned so that all of us can benefit from that. And so, um, and again, this is really down to the leader. Again, this is where it kind of, it's got to start from the top. If we have an environment where it's not okay to make mistakes because you're going to get in trouble, or you're going to get put on the short list, or you're going to get fired or whatever the consequences are, nobody's going to speak up. Mistakes are still happening, by the way. It's just mm -hmm. nobody's talking about them, and so they keep getting made. But when you can create an environment where it's okay to raise mistakes, where it's this idea of we're falling forward, right, where we're learning from them, it's not that we accept every time. If you're going to make that mistake 12 times, that's not okay. But make a mistake, learn from it, so that we don't make that mistake again. That's the whole idea. Um, but that, uh, again, these are the four sort of components of humble. Ready for human? Yeah. Okay, so human, um, to me, really, it, it, human leaders genuinely care about people. They're there for their people before they're there for anything else. Um, they recognize that people come before profit, people come before the numbers, um, and it's easy to talk about. We all talk about it. Yeah, I'm that kind of leader. But again, when the pressure gets put on the stool, when we have those deadlines, when our boss is bugging us for, you know, is on our back for the, for the quarterly numbers or whatever, is that really what our focus is? Um, and it, it's one of the things that's really fascinating to me is we put so much time and care and effort and we're so careful about who we hire. We hire the people with the best, you know, experience, with the best education, with the best results at other companies. We, we put so much time and energy into bringing on the right person. And then often we just quit there. But it's sort of like buying a really nice car, right? You do all the research and you want to buy one with all the bells and whistles and all the stuff. And it's got this amazing, it's just beautiful. And it's like going to perform so well. And then you don't charge the batteries or put gas in it. It's just going to sit there, right? And it's the same thing with people. If we don't pour into them what they need to make them go, they're going to look real good and their resume is going to be real nice, but they're not going to perform and often they'll disengage, right? And there's a really interesting um, study that uh, Gallup did. It was in 2013, but I don't think it'll ever be outdated. Um, they found three things. They found that when our bosses uh, ignore us, 40% of us actively disengage from our work. When our bosses criticize us, 22% of us actively disengage from our work. So... We're already 50% better if our bosses are rude to us because they acknowledge that we exist. That's right? bizarre. Isn't that weird? <laughs> Third thing is the most fascinating one is when our boss points out just one thing that we do well, 1% of us actively disengage. So imagine if we made it a habit to point out the good of showing people their value of connecting their the work that they're doing with something bigger than them of you know showing them that they are valued and valuable active disengagement would be like zero and that's what the that's what the crux of human is is how do we really focus on people as an individual how do we um make sure that we're pouring everything that we can into that person so they feel like who they are their ideas the work that they do really matters um, and I've got four things for human too, if you want to hear. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So four attributes of a human leader. First, they uh, connect with people in an individual way. So this is, again, figuring out what makes that person tick. What do they care about? 
um, what are their goals? What do they, what do they want to accomplish? Not just, okay, we're doing, uh, it's, oh, it's team recognition time again. I guess everybody gets a $5 gift card to Starbucks. It's how do you personalize your interaction or personalize the experience that that person has? And this is hard. It takes effort. It's, it's hard work and it takes time and energy to do it. Um, but it's so important. I'll give you a, a, a simple example. So um, a few years ago, I was on a, a remote team and for my birthday one year, I got this weird gift in the mail. It was a stick. I was like, what in the world is this? But it was a dormant tree that you plant on the ground and it's meant to grow into this beautiful, big flowering tree, right? And I thought, oh, that's interesting. But then I read the note that came along from the team and it said, um, this is a representation of our commitment to your growth and development, of your stability here in the company. And I thought, wow, like, that's awesome. Like, I will never, ever forget that gift. That is beautiful. It, yeah. And that's what it means to connect on a personal level, to really individualize. Um, and, and again, you don't have to do that something to that extent, but it can be a, a comment that's very specific to that person's value. It could be, you know, just a, a, a conversation that helps that person recognize that you see them for who they are, right? So that's thing number one. Um, second thing is... What's the second thing, Anna? Um, show people they're valued and valuable, right? Help them to recognize that the, that the work they do, um, that they're, what they're, the contribution that they make is uh, contributing to something bigger than themselves. Um, I think that's a, such a big thing that we all want to find meaning. Um, yeah. You know, and especially it's so hard for people who are, you know, in a, in a very tactical role often to connect with the, the vision of the company or the overall, you know, uh, purpose of the company. Um, so helping them to make that connection and recognize that even though it might seem like you're doing something insignificant, it really, really matters to uh, to what the team is doing or to, to what the company is doing as a whole. Um, third thing. Gosh, why am I blanking on the third thing? Peer pressure. This is where that humble part comes in. Um, hold on. going to look it up. I love it. I love it. Guys, this is imperfect action and this is shifting in progress. This is exactly how you how you do it. This is how you make wins. I love it. Yeah. I and love this it. Is how you uh, you know, kind of kill time on a on an interview. Yeah, it's how you show up authentically, which is exactly what you're talking about. Be yeah. authentic, fail forwards, and I don't think it's a fail because you have the stuff right in front of you anyways. Well, you would think so. Um <laughs> <laughs> and if you don't, we get to put a breadcrumb in a link and have people click the link to get the last two things. There you go. I'm going to find it. Uh, <laughs> wow. Really? I've just, uh, this is really, this is really driving me nuts. Okay. We're going to have to put that link in there because I can't remember the third thing. That's okay. It'll come to me in five the fourth thing is um, human leaders really, they, they care for themselves in order to be able to care for others. Um, so often we, we, I mean, with the best intentions, some of the greatest leaders just give everything they have. They give, 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 and then they have nothing left for themselves. Um, and that can work for a while, but it's not sustainable. So what, what's really important is for us to, to stop and recharge um, and to make sure that we are taken care of because that allows us to do two things. It allows us to show up better for the people that we lead or influence, obviously. Um, and then second, it, it sort of gives unspoken permission for our people to do the same thing because it's so important. We, I mean, we all have limited energy and we have to recharge at some point and burnout and stress is such a huge, huge problem. And again, I won't bore you with all the studies and all the case studies. Of, I've been of reading them. It's expensive. Yeah. It is a hugely expensive problem. Yeah. I mean, not only on the, the mental state, but literally like the expenses of health insurance. And I mean, the very logistical, like money driven things, it's hugely expensive. Um, so I, I, it's so important for us to stop and recharge. Um, and, you know, again, simple example of this, I had a boss uh, in that, that first sort of sales training uh, job that I had. Every year without fail, she would take a 10 day trip to Hawaii with her sister. Did not do a stitch of work the whole time, couldn't get a hold of her if we needed her. 
she was just completely off the grid. Now, again, this is back in the days before like we had all the technology that we have now. Um, but I like to think she would still do it that way. Um, but when she came back, she was just, she had so much energy and she was, I mean, we could just feel it and it just transferred to us. And whenever we took a vacation, like I remember my, I, I, my wife is from Brazil and I flew down there to, to meet her um, the first time, expensive first date. And I was down there for a week, did not, did not even think about work. And it was totally fine, you know, because our, my boss gave me that permission to do the same thing when it was time for me to unplug. And so that allows us to recharge and, and re-energize. So these, um, these three things, honest, humble, and human, these are what allow us to show up in a way that is real, that is human, that is um, focused on others versus ourselves. That's what allows us to stay in front of the curtain. When we show up in those ways, we don't have to put up the facade. We don't have to put on the act. We don't create unexpected experiences for people that make them go, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, can I, can I actually trust you? So that's what builds relationships. That's what helps us. And, and again, here's the thing that we're like, oh, yeah, I know that already. But we're not doing it, right? And so we have to do these um, and, and again, this is what I'm getting into in, in my book and the online course that I have is how do we make this a daily practice? How do we do it in the little things? Um, we're not going to turn the ship around overnight. I get that. Right. But as we like anything, like any good habit, it's really hard to change uh, and, and start a good habit. But we look for the little things and it's just even awareness to recognize that, oh, my gosh, I just kind of let my ego out right there. It's like, oof, you know what? I just told that little white lie. I, I wasn't really honest with my kids right then. Just recognizing it. And then in that moment, rather than letting it go, or letting it slide or, or pretending nothing happened, talk about it, bring it up, pull that curtain back. Don't hide behind it, but stay in front of it. Talk about it. Open the lines of communication. That's those little things over time, over months and years will then change us to become honest, humble, and human. Honest, humble, and human are outcomes. They're not like things that we, it's not something, I, I'm an honest leader. I'm, I'm humble. Nope. If you say it. <laughs> if you say it, it's not true. Yeah, um, it's only works when other people describe you that way, right? Yes. Um, it's yes. sort of like, oh, I'm a great listener. Well, unless you really feel like I'm listening to you, my assessment of my listening skills is completely irrelevant, right? Let's really quickly, because we're running out of time, and I want to make sure that we get this in here. For people who are out there right now, and we have people running big corporations, uh, sole proprietors, individuals, parents, how can they bring you to their organizations? How can they get coaching? How can they take your courses? How do they get more of you and what you know? Yeah, so, um, I mean reach out on my website, davidjmead.com. Uh, all the resources are on there. I've got a bunch of free stuff, um, a lot of videos and weekly, I do a weekly tip um, video that talks about some of these things. Uh, there's also a link to the online course on there. Um, reach out to me if you're interested in, in bringing me in person or virtually. Um, would love to, to share more of these ideas. And again, the, the idea is not um, that you, you have to hire me. I have tons of you know free stuff um, that, that's, that's available for you as well. So for corporations, is there a special link or it's all on the main website? It's all on the main one. Um, I will say though, the, the online course that I've got is designed to um, either be taken individually, so any individual can sign up for it, but it's, there's also a facilitator-led course where somebody within an organization can essentially facilitate a room full of you know, their, their teammates um, they'll watch the videos of me, you know, giving the content, but they essentially facilitate the conversations and that kind of stuff. So it's all self-contained and you can actually do it on your own, uh, as an organization. That's awesome. And if somebody wants to jump the queue and get some one-on-one -on -one love from you and some one-on-one -on -one coaching, do you do that as well? Yes, absolutely. Awesome. Okay. So I'm going to drop the main link down underneath. So anyone who's watching this, you'll see this is going to be below, below the video and you'll be able to go to the website, davidjmead.com uh, okay. yep. and get all of this stuff there. Again, contact him, call him up, show him some love, put comments below. And thank you, David, for coming in today. Thank you so much for a wonderful interview. I would love to have you back to dig more into some of these individual concepts. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Anna. It's been a pleasure. Thanks. Thanks.